On a bright and sunny evening this June, the slowly thawing carcass of a seal lay on the floor of Walker Court, the art gallery of Ontario's central and most public hub. A group of Inuit carved carefully into its pale hide, revealing the dark crimson meat below, and distributed it piece by piece to the large, slightly apprehensive crowd that waited all around. The occasion was an art opening, the likes of which the gallery has hosted hundreds of times. But never, perhaps, quite like this. Upstairs in its Zach's Pavilion, the largest and most ceremonious of its gallery spaces typically proffered to host such international luminaries as Georgia O'Keeffe, Pablo Picasso and Ai Weiwei, was too near a saying it, an exhibition of dozens of works by the Inuit artists Kano Wakishevik and Tim Pitsulik. The show, like the seal, was an outward signal of something different, something new, a center stage treatment for indigenous art and culture in the museum's most hallowed space. Kanawaki Shevik's images of colorful, fanciful birds occupy a large portion of one gallery. There's this stereotype of a barren and solitary land. But everything is so full of color and life, said co-curator Lakulik Williamson Batori. Murray White, a viewer observes Tim Pitsilak's 2012 piece, Swimming with Giants at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Murray White, Tim Pitsilak's Morning Commute, 2015, as seen at the Art Gallery of Ontario, photography by Ian Lefebvre, courtesy Art Gallery of Ontario, co-curator Lakulik Williamson Batori, left, helps to carve a seal at the Art Gallery of Ontario for the opening of Two Near Saying It, an exhibition of Inuit contemporary art by the late aunt and nephew pairing of Kanawaki Shevik and Tim Pitsulik, Courtesy Art Gallery of Ontario, Kanawaki Shevik, Luminous Char, 2008, Courtesy Art Gallery of Ontario, This comes not from nowhere, the past several years have seen a burgeoning priority on Indigenous art in Canadian museums and galleries from coast to coast, an effort to knit together cultural expression from both sides of the colonial divide into a more holistic national project. Vigo, for its part, has been at the forefront of such efforts, installing Juan de Nanabish as its first curator of indigenous art in 2016. Its Canadian galleries had already displayed an interwoven narrative, indigenous and not, for years. Nonetheless, if there's even been so significant a display of indigenous art here, and so outward a star-making effort as too near a saying it, I haven't seen it. It does more work than any exhibition in recent memory, but carries its freight with no signs of strain. Too near a saying it, firstly, is a memorial exhibition for Pitsulik, the brilliant and prolific Cape Dorset artist whose tragic death in late 2016 from pneumonia still serves as damning exemplar of how under-resourced northern communities remain. Had a proper hospital been closer at hand, he likely would have survived, but it's also a link between generations. A Shevik, now deceased, was his aunt and a star in her own right, that helps underscore both the tiny community's status as an artistic powerhouse, and the power of community that has allowed it to thrive. That's a lot to ask of any art exhibition, but too near saying it performs admirably with an understated, clear-eyed grace. An exhibition largely of the two artists' remarkably gorgeous drawings, it begins with an atmospheric stage setter, artist and exhibition co-curator Lakulik Williamson Batori's Silap Pudunga, a video projection of the blinding, icy flatness of the far north, and unearthly howl intermingling with the groaning wind. The sound infuses the rest of the exhibition, bringing life to the still images on the walls. Article continued below, Southerners may see it as a void, Batori says, looking at the icy, wind-whipped landscape in the work. But there's a richness to the landscape that's invisible to them. That's that history of racism and colonialism in this country, there's this stereotype of a barren and solitary land. But everything is so full of color and life. A few steps away and into the work of a Shevik, that's borne out. Her most famous work, The Enchanted Owl, a many-plumed creature shifting color left to right from red to black, serves almost as an Inuit art meme, viral as any in its canon, and one you'll surely know on site.
Tunira sang it broadens the frame with an array of prints and drawings alive with vibrant hues, a fish trailing bobbers of red, blue and green, a bird startling in vibrant hues of fuchsia and gold. Shevik was born in 1927 and raised on the land, moving from summer to winter camps in tents or carmack, sod houses made from stone, whalebone and earth. That was before government housing became the dominant form of dwelling through the 1950s and 60s as the Federal Department of Resources and Development took over responsibility for administration of the North and the people living there, bringing their nomadic lifestyle largely to a halt. With the Feds came James Houston, an artist who, in 1951, established the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, now Kinge Studios, in Cape Dorset as a production center for Inuit art to be sold in the South. Artists like Ashevik, who had been creating works with materials at hand, she sewed, largely, Batori said, were handed paper and pencil for the first time, and an industry was born. Ashevik drew scenes of the everyday, her early graphite drawings include hunting scenes, or moving camp from summer to winter. Just as early, thought and fantasy intrude. Creatures intertwine with myth, Sun Owl, from 1963, presents a creature with fiery plumes, unstuck from reality, drawing for bird fantasy print, 1958-59, has multiple heads, plumes and wings, bursting in all directions. It seems to point to a shevik shove from one to the other, her personal history suggests a violent transition, her father, a shaman, was murdered by Inuit who had converted to Christianity. In her way, she pushed back, holding fast to her cultural identity in her works, which she laced with subtle signals of resilience. One Piece, 1992's creation of Nunavut, an Inuit cosmology depicting its six seasons in Arundel, suggests both perpetual endurance and a stand taken, made as preparations for Nunavut as a territory were finalized in 1993, though it wasn't made official until 1999, it was a political statement that we wanted a place in determining our own future, Batori said. Kanoak was such a force. Outsiders don't necessarily understand her, or how much of a source of inspiration she is for us. Article continued below with these ideas surely infused in his mind, Pitts Ulick first picked up a pencil some decades later, and it's into his world we cross through a narrow passageway accompanied with the den of heavy machinery. So the exhibition is cleaved neatly in two, a Shevik first, Pitts Ulick second, and I wondered for a moment if there might be some insights to be gleaned to presenting the two artists interwoven, as though engaged in the conversation they enjoyed, and Eden F.U., for so many years. But walking through Pitts Ulick's portion of the exhibition, the line is clear. Where Shevik lived through her world in rough transition, Pitts Ulax was one in which balance started to be redrawn. Best known for his frank images of everyday life, heavy machinery being transported by barge, an enormous cannedral used to carve holes in the frozen rock for house pilings, Pitts Ulick was committed to core elements of Inuit life, the hunt, with his images of flayed walrus carcasses staining snow with blood, or a freshly killed bowhead whale being ferried ashore alongside kayaks. One piece of snowmobiles silhouetted on the ice under a luminous sky at sunset, fuses the artist's plain spokenness with his impish humor, he called it morning commute, but too near a saying it also brims with Pitsilex lively scenes of fantasy and mythology drawn from the Inuit's 4,000-year history in the north. Kalu Balak Makgu, from 2012, depicts the undersea creature of childhood legend parents used to keep children from wandering onto the ice. In the story, the Kalu Balak would drag children down into the icy sea to keep them for their own. A terror pits Eula creates with chilling aplomb, his olive green pencils crafting serpentine arms on black paper, reaching up towards flailing children's legs on the surface. Another remarkable piece called, Simply, from the past, 2015, shows a bowhead, a creature of huge ceremonial significance to the Inuit, to say nothing of the tons of meat its annual hunt delivers, carrying the full arc of Inuit history inside its giant form, its people, their land, their stories, their lives. 
There is, in fact, so much here, it serves to heighten the tragedy of Pitsilek's untimely end. Astonishingly prolific and inventive, his prodigious talent made it possible for him to do virtually anything. His towering 2012 piece Swimming with Giants is surely a showstopper, the fluid outlines of bowhead and beluga whales seeming almost to be in motion before your eyes. But he was experimenting to the last. Some of his final drawings were made using an underwater GoPro camera, one venture producing a meeting between a seal and a bowhead just underfoot below the ice. He was exploring new technique, too, in that image, the contour of the seal was made by gently rubbing color away from his surface, not adding to it, revealing a growing technical mastery that surely would have led to ever more masterful pieces. What Pixulik leaves behind, aside from a body of incomparably beautiful, accomplished works, is, like his aunt, a legacy of innovation and staunch commitment to an ancient culture, proving them not to be mutually exclusive. This display, Bigo makes clear that it agrees. That's progress. To Nira saying it, Kano Wakishevik and Tim Pitsulik continues at the Art Gallery of Ontario until August. 12 Murray White is the star's art critic based in Toronto. Follow him on Twitter, at UntitledToronto.